so happy to be here. This is my first time at EuroPython, uh, first time speaking and first time attending. Um, uh, as, the, uh, as I was uh, introduced, I'm uh, originally from Toronto, Canada, uh, and this has been really awesome so far. So I'm gonna, my talk is situated perfectly because the previous talk introduced everybody to the concept of vector search and hybrid search. Uh, I'm gonna build a little bit on top of that where I'm gonna talk about how you can include searching over images, video, audio as well and how you can build all of this with Python uh, using, using the technologies that were uh, talked about before. So just to give a quick kind of um, overview, by the end of this talk, you'll understand how this type of application works, and the application is fully open sourced. If you, uh, if you scan that QR code, it'll take you to the GitHub, GitHub repository. Uh, that'll show you how uh, I built this. But let me play this for you guys, and uh, we, can, we can get an understanding of how this is built. So the main idea behind this app is that you're searching here just with uh, text, so your input is text, but what's coming out is multimodal in the sense that it can be any type of uh, multimedia file. It can be a video, an image, it can be a text file as well, but here I've, I haven't put any of those uh, into the database. It can be an audio file as well. Um, and in this talk, I'll talk about how I built this and how you can build this as well. All right. Um, as I was introduced already, my, my name is Zan Hessen. I uh, work at Weaviate. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about what Weaviate does uh, in a second, but the more important thing is that uh, I'm really passionate about AI and the good that it can do for humanity. Um, I, I'm a trained engineer. I've been working in machine learning for a while now, and Weaviate is an open source vector database, so just to quickly give an understanding of what it can do, uh, it can essentially help you build the hybrid search technologies that the last speakers were talking about. Uh, in addition to scaling it up. Okay, so let's start off with a question. How many people here know uh, what a vector database is? Okay, great. So that's about, I think, 20%, 25%. That's pretty good. Uh, I'll do a quick five-minute intro to what vector databases are and how I understand them. So if you think about all of the data that lives on your computer uh, over here, so these can be any emails, videos, audio files, text, uh, text files, PDFs, you're gonna take all that data and you're gonna pass it through some form of AI machine learning based model. And the job of this machine learning model is to convert your data into vectors. And vectors here are just, um, just uh, arrays of floating point numbers. So every object that you had here, whether it's one email or whether one piece of one email, is gonna get converted into one vector. Uh, and the great thing about this vector is that it preserves the meaning of the data once it's translated. So you've got human understandable data up here. You and I can read it, see it, understand it. And then you've got the translation of that data, which is machine understandable. And then to understand this better, we're gonna plot out these vectors into some sort of three-dimensional vector space. As the last speakers mentioned, this vector is typically from anywhere from 1,000 to 4,000 dimensional. But here I've uh, shown it to you in 3D. And the great thing about these machine learning models that we're leveraging to convert our data into vectors is that they preserve a lot of the meaning behind the data. So if I have an image over here uh, of a chicken and the word chicken, because that's semantically related, those two objects, those two vectors are gonna be closer together in vector space. Uh, whereas if you take dissimilar concepts like a wolf and a banana, those two things are dissimilar so they're gonna be farther apart in vector space. And so you're able to convert your data into a machine understandable format while still preserving a lot of the human semantics that go into determining uh, what composes that data. And you can do this with text usually, but a lot of people are now beginning to do this with images, video, audio files, uh, and you name it. And so every uh, object uh, that you want to search over or you want to store in your vector database gets projected into vector space. One of those green dots is one object. And effectively what you're doing here is, if you think about this translation, we're looking at the concept of a, of a data point and we're trying to identify where in vector space it belongs. So it's kind of like the analogy of a library where depending on what your book is about, 
you'll find it in a different location in the library. If it's about civil engineering, you'll find it in a different section. If it's about arts and craft, it'll be in a completely different section of the library. Uh, so the way I like to think about vector databases are essentially as gigantic libraries that locate your data in a very specific uh, space, uh, depending on what the vector is, and the vector database, the search engine that's powering all of this, is essentially a superhuman librarian where you take the query that you're interested in to them and they'll get you the five most relevant things back. Now it depends, uh, whatever your data is in, whether it's text data, images, audio, if you can turn that data into a vector, you can take advantage of this uh, vector database technology to search over it and uh, add that capabilities into your applications. Right. So one example of how vector search works, you're gonna take all of your data, you're gonna index it and project it into this vector space. So once you've got all of your data, this is typically anywhere from millions of data points to billions of data points. And then the user comes along and asks the query. So let's say that red dot over there is our query. And the really cool thing about vector databases is that the query is not necessarily a separate filter uh, or a keyword. It's, it can be any English sentence. It can be anything that can be, that can be turned into a vector as well and projected into this vector space. And the act of vector searching is effectively looking around in the proximity of that data point and saying, which of my indexed objects are the most semantically uh, or similar in meaning to my query object? And then you're retrieving those and sending that back to the user. And so in short, the entire vector search pipeline looks like this. You, it revolves around some machine learning model, the encoder typically. You pass your data through it during the indexing phase. You dump it into a vector database like Weaviate, and then the user comes along with a query. That's gonna go through the same pathway of the encoder. You get a vector for that query, and the, the vector database is going to spit out a bunch of results ranked uh, in order of relevance to the query for the user. And then you can uh, throw that back to your application and use it however you'd like. So effectively, it's kind of like a Google search over your own personal data. Google had this, uh, I believe starting in 2015, where they started adding machine learning based semantic search on top of the hybrid, uh, on top of the keyword search. Uh, and vector databases give you the ability to do this with your own personal data over your own enterprise documents now. Okay. So this talk is mainly about handling multimodal data. So if you've got images, audio, video files, how do you now understand semantically searching over those? And so the rest of this talk is going to dive into how that happens and how, what types of models you can use to do that. So I'll talk a little bit about what multimodal models are. And I know the last talk spoke about multilingual models. And a lot of people refer to multimodal as multilingual, but I, here when I say multimodal, I specifically mean videos, images, different multimedia formats. And so about uh, a year ago now, uh, there was a debate in Toronto where they were discussing whether AI was going to pose an existential threat to humans. Um, and then there was a kind of an open timeline of uh, when, when this would uh, materialize. So let me start off with, with this question. How many people here think that AI is going to pose an existential threat in the next five years? Yes, no? Very few hands go up. I, I, I guess I'm asking it in the wrong setting. Very educated people here that know about AI, so. I don't, I don't think so either, and the, the reason why a lot of people that don't believe in this, uh, the reason why they don't believe in it, uh, is because we don't have AI that can do all of these very simple things for humans, right? Things that you and I take for granted. Uh, we don't have a successful self-driving car. You, you see all these videos of uh, weird mistakes it's making. But even simpler, if you go down this stack, these are really simple things. We don't even have robots that can walk naturally. So it, it mimic the gait patterns of, of humans. And so this is known as Moravec's paradox, where things that are very, very difficult for us, so language translation, playing chess, calculus, things that need to, we need to be trained on are very easy for AI. But on the other hand, things that are very easy for us are insanely difficult for AI, right? Walking, running, setting up a table, all of these uh, fine motor actions, these uh, different sensory uh, actions are almost impossible for AI right now. And this is what people are saying is the missing link for AI to, uh, to be generally knowledgeable. And so in order to understand multimodal models and how they work, we need to understand a little bit better about how humans learn. So I have a son who's about a year and a half now, and if you think about how humans develop, the first 
year, year and a half of their uh, age, they don't speak a lot. So he speaks maybe five, 10, 15 words, but a lot of the learning that happens in these early years is uh, very kind of sensory based, smelling, touching, uh, putting things in his mouth uh, and kind of interaction based. And then on top of this kind of foundational knowledge, you build, uh, your, uh, you build uh, more skills using language. A lot of the models that we have right now are masters of language, but don't have any understanding outside of language. Slowly but surely, we're getting language vision models that are um, kind of built on top of the language models, but we need a lot more of this sensory input to be able to do cross-modal reasoning. So this talk is more about jumping off points. I'm gonna talk about multimodality and what resources you can use. Um, and uh, I'm gonna touch on it. It's not an in-depth talk. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the end. I've actually made a whole course uh, for people that are uh, interested in this. All right. So the last talk talked about taking this idea of having a text-based input and then passing it through some form of text encoder and it generating a vector. But now I want you to think of this as four different models where you've got specialist models for each modality. You have an image understanding model, an audio understanding model, and a video encoder model. And the job of all of these models is to generate their corresponding multimedia format into a vector. And because the original data point was semantically similar, you know, multimedia wise it's completely different, but it's all about lines, the projected vector should also be similar. So if you notice the, uh, the vectors, they're quite similar uh, across the dimensions. And that's because semantically all of these things are very uh, similar. If they were books in a library, they would all be in the same location in the library. And there's even work that's being done that allows you to digitize smell. Right? So this is at work from a company that spun out of Google and they're putting out research. This is not publicly available um, in terms of usage for now, but they're essentially building up this odor map where if you can take different molecules, you can project it into vector space and get an understanding of what, does, uh, what is a grapey smell or a musky smell as well. And like I said, if you can turn your data into a vector, then you can take advantage of this uh, vector database approximate nearest neighbors technology to perform retrieval and search over it. Okay, so once you've got these models that are combined and can understand all of this different multimedia format, you can essentially pass in any type of your data. Right? So typically this is language, but increasingly we're seeing applications where this could be images, especially for e-commerce platforms and social media platforms, you've got a lot of image modality, audio, uh, video, and then you've also got applications where you have uh, sensory motor proprioception data that can all be embedded into a unified vector space where now you can start to say, this is the image that I'm interested in, give me anything that's remotely uh, relevant to this image. So your query can be an image, your query can be an audio file as well. And so now you can take any one of these objects as input queries, and you can project the query into vector space, and then the vector space can spit back whatever is relevant, whether that's an audio file, whether that's an image, or a text file. And so this gives you a lot of cross-modal functionality, which is what humans are really good at. So you can take an audio file and you can retrieve images or video. You can take images and video, retrieve an audio file. Um, and so this is uh, a model that we integrated into EV8 so that people can build multimodal applications a lot easier. And this model allows you to combine uh, multimedia formats. So if you have an image or an audio file, you can project it into vector space and you can take the vectors and add them together to do multimodal retrieval. And so this, uh, this type of technology now gives you the ability to reason over these multimedia formats, more, uh, more similar to what a human can do. And so a lot of people are interested in large language models, but um, now we're increasingly seeing companies like Google, Anthropic, OpenAI, move more towards large multimodal models that can increasingly understand images, video, audio files as well. So in the last part of this talk, I wanna talk a little bit about who's using these models in production. Uh, a lot of the use cases that you hear about these days are mainly around text-based search. That's what the last talk was about. But some of our biggest customers are actually using multimodal applications uh, in production. So the biggest use case here is uh, around e-commerce. And typically this is because e-commerce companies have not just text assets for their products, but they also have images, they have videos, and they've got, uh, they've got uh, audio uh, files as well. And the reason why multimodality is revolutionizing e-commerce is quite simple. Right? 
So if I ask you a very simple question, what type of burger do you like? This, is, this forms the basis of all recommend, recommender system technology. It is, uh, fundamentally it is this simple. How do you take a, a customer's likes and dislikes and then how do you rank your catalog, your products based on this like and dislike? Historically, this question was answered using one modality, text. So you can describe to me what you like and I've got a description of all of my products. And then I can do this ranking based on text and say, okay, this product matches your description the most, so it's going to be number one on my recommendations list. Right? But now, if you can capture multiple modalities, you can ask the person, show me what type of burger you like, because now you have a way of capturing that into a vector, and now you can rank and search based on that vector. Right? You can ask people, what does the perfect burger smell like? What does it sound like? Is it crunchy? So on and so forth. Right? And so you can now, you have more dimensions and senses to capture a person's likes and dislikes across. So all of these different modalities now uh, kind of identify every user uniquely. And then because you have, uh, there's also work that's being done on taking tabular data and capturing that. So you can take nutritional facts, turn that into an Excel sheet and into a table, and then you can project that into vector space to use it for recommendations as well. But the key point here is that because we now have a way to recommend off of these modalities, you, uh, because you can turn these modalities into vectors, you can now build them into your, uh, into your uh, platforms. Uh, and even better yet, why one vector? You also have multi-vector uh, multi retrieval systems where you can say some products are mainly bought due to their descriptions, but a lot of other products might be bought due to the way they look. Uh, some products might be bought due to the way they smell. Right? So that company that I was talking about um, called Osmo, it's, is quite useful for some products, but completely useless for other products, right? So the way you buy different products uh, depends, on, uh, depends on different senses. And now you have the ability to leverage those senses to recommend, uh, recommend to those customers. And this is not just uh, work that's being done uh, around this uh, by Amazon and Facebook Marketplace. Uh, and the reason why it's so powerful is because you now can more ide uniquely identify what a customer likes and what they dislike because you have more senses to do this with. I might like the way something looks, but I don't like the brand. And now you have a way to differentiate uh, between those two uh, senses. You can also compare products uh, more uniquely because you can compare across modalities. You can say, uh, this is what it's described as, this is the metadata, but then this is what it looks like as well, and I don't like the way that it looks. And then if you've got two very similar products, you now have multiple dimensions to differentiate them across. And so this is work from Amazon actually, and the link is at the bottom there, where if a user came in and they passed in or they clicked on this particular product, their previous recommender system would recommend to you things like this. And you can see why it makes sense, because these are all things that are functionally the same. But the problem is that they don't visually match. And this is more of a, uh, of a, uh, of a text-based recommender system. And when they added the multimodality component into it, these are the recommendations that came out. Right? And one thing you note here is that not only are they functionally the same, but they actually look the same. They're in the same position. Uh, the the uh, kind of the visual features are very similar. And this is the type of kind of uh, robustness that multimodality can uh, add to your uh, e-commerce platforms and e-commerce recommender systems as well. And then the second application where we're seeing a lot of uh, customers use multimodality is uh, for multimodal retrieval augmented generation. So I'll talk a little bit about what retrieval augmented generation is and then how multimodality plays a role in it. So if you think about how all of us are using large language models, typically we have some question and we pass it over to a language model to, to take in, reason over, and then produce some output that uh, is answering this prompt, uh, hopefully. A lot of people are now saying, you, if you give it reference material, you can actually control the generation a lot better. You can reduce hallucinations a lot better. So this is equivalent to being asked a question, but then also being given reference material to say, this information might be relevant for you to read before you have to give me an answer. And so this is a very simple concept. In, in your prompt, you have space for relevant context material that you add in, and now you get a language model to reason over your data and uh, answer questions. 
And so now you get customized uh, responses because you can stuff in any context here that the language model can read over. And the really powerful thing about this is that this, these can be your enterprise documents, these can be your company documents that the language model was never trained on, but now it can read in the, uh, in, uh, at inference time, and then it can customize the response based on this. And so this is a very simple concept. It has a very complicated name called uh, retrieval augmented generation, but the concept is quite simple. And so how this modifies the vector search pipeline is that everything stays the same, except what comes out of the vector database now is being given to a language model to form its relevant context. And so the reason why people are in, uh, interested and excited about vector databases specifically for augmenting uh, language models is because of the scalability. Right? If you have a vector database that you're searching over your data with and you're filtering documents with, you can scale up to billions of documents and you can uh, retain a, a, a latency that's real time sub uh, 50 milliseconds. And so the reason why I, I'm bringing all of this up is because now we're beginning to see how people are retrieving non-textual context. If you have images, video, audio, you can also index that into a vector database and you can retrieve from that, right? So if the prompt comes in and the, the most relevant piece of information in your database is not a, uh, not a text document, but rather an image, now that gets retrieved and now you can concatenate the text prompt and the image together and now you have a language, uh, a large multimodal model that can understand images and prompts and now it'll give you a customized response by looking at the image, understanding the question and then generating some answer. And this is the, the concept of multimodal RAG that we're now seeing people um, use and, and start to build with. So that's a, a quick kind of outline of uh, multimodality. Uh, there's a lot more to dive into here. I made a whole course uh, around this and we delivered it with uh, Andrew Ng. Uh, if people are interested, there's a, that, there's a QR code if you're interested. It's a, it's a short course, so you can watch it over a, a lunchtime. And it goes into not just the embedding model component of it, but also how you train uh, large language models to see, how do you take a language model, turn it into a language vision model, all of those details, and then there's a bunch of applications at the end that we uh, build as well. I'll leave that up there for a second. And thank you so much. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll take those now, but if you have questions later on, I'm uh, very happy to connect afterwards uh, online or uh, wherever. We have three minutes for one or two questions. So if you have a question, please move to the microphone and ask. Hi, um, excellent talk, thank you so much. So I have a question uh, coming back to your burger example. Um, so imagine if I don't wanna compile them, but I would like to create a golden standard burger like the best ever. Mm -hmm. How would I go around it? How, how would do I get to extract these features from the vector database? I suppose it must be a very naive question, but I'm yeah. just very curious about that. Yeah, so what, one thing that you can do is actually take a multi-vector approach where if you're interested in seeing how uh, user behavior is uh, kind of uh, taking into account your product, you can actually take those four separate models. You can take text models, image models, and you can project your products into vector space using those models individually. So you can have a text vector, you can have an image vector, and maybe a nutritional vector, and then you can recommend based on those, and you can perform A-B testing to see what type of recommendation system do you often get hits off of, and which ones uh, underperform. And there's an actually a, a whole field of explainable AI research that's going into studying which modality is responsible for when a sale happens and which one is not. So when people buy food, do they buy it because of the way it looks? And when people buy clothes, do they buy it because of the way it's described or the brand? And so there's actually a whole field of explainability where you can extract uh, how often a text vector is successfully used versus how often an image vector is used. Uh, and this is in contrast to how Amazon and Facebook are using it, where they're taking the text vector and the image vector and they're just adding them together. So now you've got both of those vectors blended into one vector representation. All right, thank you so much. Yeah. One other thing, so for people that are uh, interested in this, all of the code is available here. I'll paste these slides uh, afterwards. Uh, and uh, also, if you're, if you're interested in uh, building with this, the, this is where the code is coming from.
Thank you very much. Um, we have a little present you. for you. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we can't take any more questions, but you can always find Zane outside and ask any questions. The next session starts in five minutes.